There's this line from the gospel reading you just heard that I think speaks to us where we are. Jesus is giving this long teaching here in Luke chapter 12, and he has this line, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think there's something about that line, the idea in that line that resonates with us, that speaks to us right where we are. It kind of puts our feet back on the ground, puts our hearts in the right place. It reminds us that the spiritual things are more important than the material things around us. The, it seems like we need this reminder from time to time, and yet, and somehow we all kind of agree on it, on its truth. And a few years ago, it got put on a bumper sticker, the most important things in life are not things. And I always seem to see that bumper sticker pasted on the back of SUVs on their way to the Outer Banks. <laughs> that notion that the spiritual things in life are more important than the material things in life is actually an impediment. It holds us back from really hearing the joy and the freedom, hearing the liberation that Jesus offers in this passage. It kind of boxes us in theologically so that we can't hear this incredible message that he's giving. In fact, the passage is saying the opposite. It's not that material things don't matter, it's that they matter a lot, that they are the ways in which we work out our spiritual lives. We need to pay really close attention to why it is we say the most important things in life are not things. Why we have this troubled relationship with our material resources. And we have to ask ourselves a really hard question. If you don't remember anything about this sermon, maybe you can remember this question. Are we, are we justifying our material abundance by saying that the material things don't really matter? Are we trying to resolve somehow our cognitive dissonance in our world of, of material abundance and consumerism? Are we trying to say, to let us let ourselves off the hook by saying, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's the spiritual things that matter. I have to struggle with that question. I struggle with it almost every day. Um, and I offer it to you for your own reflection. For us to understand what Jesus was talking about, to understand the meaning of this passage, when he says to people that they need to sell their possessions and give alms, that they need to build up treasures of a different kind in a different place, that they need to be ready and alert and watching. When Jesus says all of those things, for us to understand what he is getting at, we have to remember who it is he's talking with. We have to know something more about his audience for us to understand the passage. Have you ever wondered, we hear these scripture readings from the gospels all the time and there's this ever present crowd, right? Have you ever wondered where these crowds come from? They seem everywhere in the gospel and they seem to be following him around. How is it that these people had all of this time to follow Jesus around the countryside? I went away for a week this summer and I had to have all kinds of people covering all of these aspects of my life. Where did they get that kind of time? And did you ever notice that they never seem to have enough to eat? <laughs> right? They're going away for a long period of time and they don't even take a knapsack. And then when it comes time to eat, they don't go get anything. They seem to wait around for something else to happen some food to appear. The answer to all of those questions is that because these people mostly were landless people. They were landless people who had been displaced by empire. The Roman Empire, along with their allies in Palestine, systematically took their land through a process of taxation and debt. 
And then they consolidated those small parcels of family land into large tracts in what we would probably call an ancient form of agribusiness. Huge portions of these, the harvests off of that land would go to Rome as tribute and tax. A large portion would also stay in Palestine as a tax so that the Roman allies there could engage in huge building projects. People that you would have heard in the Gospels like Herod, who built Sepphoris and Caesarea and Capernaum, three major city projects in the ancient world, as well as the temple in Jerusalem. The reason these crowds had the time to follow Jesus is because they had nowhere else to go. They were landless and they were caught in a system that kept them right on the edge of starvation. And if you are a large landowner, that's exactly where you want your agricultural labor force to be so that they will take any work that they can get for any wage offered. That's why these stories in the Gospels about feeding people, they're not about our individual relationships with God. They're not about our private spirituality. They're stories about a revolution. They're stories about God overthrowing empire and feeding people, feeding people with abundance from the fecundity of their own land. When Jesus says, now you know the group now, and when Jesus says to them, sell your possessions and give alms, when he says that to this crowd, either he is completely tone deaf to the situation around him, or He's saying something deeper. He's saying something on another frequency that just barely registers in our 21st century American middle-class ears. The fact that these displaced farmers and fisher folk responded to him in such large numbers tells us something, tells us that he was saying something that resonated with them, something that spoke to them about their experience of imperial displacement and disorder. He was offering them something more than handouts. He was offering them something more than free food. He was offering them something more than charity. He was giving them something more than just a political ideology that was gonna get them all killed. He offered them a social and spiritual revolution that was going to give them hope right there where they lived. And he offers it to them <laughs> in a story about eating. It occurred to me a few weeks ago as I was walking through a place called Death Canyon um, in the Grand Tetons that you could tell Jesus almost his entire life and ministry by recounting and exploring the stories about eating in the Gospels, about meals he attended, meals he hosted, about what he said about food, food production, and eating. You could even throw it a little bit wider and tell the entire Jewish Christian spiritual tradition by looking at meals, by looking at what the scripture says about food production and eating and land, from the eating of the apple in Genesis to the supper of the lamb in Revelation. It's all right there. So of course, Jesus is going to start a revolution by telling a story about a meal. And he sets his story in the context of a Roman household. A Roman household had strict, rigid, exploitive, impenetrable hierarchy in it. The male master was at the top, the enslaved people were at the bottom, and everybody else in the household had to find their place somewhere in between, and they didn't move among the layers. I just need to insert parenthetically, 
don't look at this story as an allegory, okay? Where one person, like the master represents God, that's not what this story is about. It's not an allegory. It's just a story with a point. Jesus says that the enslaved members of the household stayed up and they were waiting. They were watching. They were alert for the master of the house to come home. Where was he? He was at a meal. He was at a wedding banquet, no less. And then when he comes home, this extraordinary, shocking, stunning thing happens. He gets a belt and he puts it around himself to hold up his rich man's cloak. And he gets down on his knees. He gets down on the floor and has them sit around him. And then this other extraordinary, outrageous thing happens. He feeds them. What an outrageous turn of events. Everybody who heard Jesus tell this story would have gotten it. You can hear them kind of laughing and applauding. Jesus just turned the world upside down. You can also, if you really pay attention to it, you can hear that, you can see that smirk on his face. He just told this story. He encased a revolutionary idea in a story. And in telling a story, rather than just being explicit about it, he holds off the Romans from killing him a little bit longer. Encased in this story, Jesus says two things. First of all, he pronounces judgment on the imperial system. On this whole system of hierarchy and domination, and agricultural exploitation upon which the Roman Empire was built, he condemns it. And I might say, incidentally, all empires are built on the same things. Jesus' story is an attempt to overthrow the empire. The other thing he does is he offers a way of being, a way for this group of people to form a new type of community, of building a world right underneath of that empire. Instead of hierarchy and domination and global economics and the exploitation of the earth and of its people, he says that local people caring for one another, caring for the land upon which they live, that, he says, is the kingdom of God. That is heaven on earth. The way we enter this world, the way we enter into this world that Jesus envisioned and told in his stories and lived at tables, the way we enter it is not by saying that the spiritual is more important than the material things, but rather seeing the material world as essential to the spiritual life. The world God is birthing here among us is not made by hierarchy and domination. It's made by equality and cooperation. Only a people, only a people who cares deeply for each other will care deeply for the earth on which they live. 